Donald Trump just won the presidential elections in the United States. The far-right, anti-migrant former president won a resounding victory against Kamala Harris on Tuesday, November 5th. One of the cornerstones of his agenda and campaign was a promise to carry out the largest deportation drive in U.S. history, promising to deport as many as 10 million people, and in his words, end the invasion of the United States. To understand what his victory means for immigrant communities across the United States and how communities are organizing to fight back, we are honored to be joined by Pablo Alvarado, the co-director of renowned worker and immigrant rights organization, the National Day Laborer Organizing Network, Endelon. Pablo, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Well, first off, I just wanted to get your initial uh, assessment and analysis of what happened uh, in in the elections on Tuesday, these results, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on what happened? Well, it's um, very sad that um, the country decided to elect um, a fascist as um, its um, leader, a pathological liar, um, a hateful person, a, um, a folk hero, of white supremacists uh, in this country. That is the person that uh, the American voters decided to elect. And I guess uh, that's democracy and we have to accept it, uh, but we have to resist um, his uh, policies, particularly because uh, uh, my community, the migrant community was, um, probably the main target throughout the electoral process. Um, the language that he used to describe our community uh, is uh, um, overheated rhetoric and language that has been used in the past that has actually led to terrible things in human history. A lot of the language is language that was repeated during during the during the World War II, you know, calling people, tell, saying that people are poisoning the blood of the country, um, talking about the enemy within, saying that he's going to go after um, his uh, political adversaries and use the military, um, saying I mean, the threats are. are threats that we're definitely taking very serious. And the threats um, that resonate to immigrants and people are, immigrants themselves are, are talking about this is that he's gonna build the largest detention camps the country has ever seen, that he's gonna carry out the largest deportation operation in the country's um, history, um, that he's gonna take uh, away birthright uh, citizenship. And that is just to name a few of the threats that uh, that he's made. Obviously, uh, the threats and the characterization of our community uh, lead to many other things that happen to workers who are every day in the streets or at the workplace. Um, all of a sudden, if the president is referring to uh, immigrants, uh, the way he's referring to, um, then imagine what those who believe his words, imagine how they would treat immigrants, employer who hire workers are going to refuse to pay their wages because, you know, what are you going to do? You're, un you're undocumented anyway. Um, I imagine police officers who have that kind of sentiment in their heart, uh, similar to Donald uh, Trump's sentiment. I imagine police officers enforcing the law from that angle. Um, stopping people because they might look undocumented and questioning, um, inquiring about people's immigration uh, status. Uh, so words have consequences. I remember that um, there was this man who went and shot 50 people uh, and killed uh, 23 people at El Paso, Texas, because he believed that um, the country is under an, uh, a Mexican invasion, he's, he said. He was afraid of that. And we know who has used that kind of language. So some people take those kinds of, that kind of language very serious. And we wanna take it serious so that we can uh, protect ourselves because, you know, it turns out that he's used so many lies and, 
and things that are ridiculous. Like, for example, that, um, I mean, I, I don't know any immigrant. I'm, you know, any immigrant who comes to the country because he or she comes to vote. I don't know, you know, I mean, it's, I, I don't know anybody who eats pets, you know, and, and, and they know that this is ridiculous, but that's, that is precisely the point, to make a mockery of our community, to make a mockery of the issues that, you know, that um, impact our, our people. Yeah, I mean, you know, you went right to it, but I think to reiterate, really one of the most uh, formidable elements of Trump's campaign promises and his program is exactly what you just referred to, which is this uh, alleged mass deportation drive. Um, you mentioned that he has promised to build the largest kind of new detention centers, but can you tell us a little bit more about what this what would this even look like? He said that he wants to deport as many as 10 million people. Um, who, what communities are at risk for this? And, you know, it's it's obviously known that the U.S. economy runs on the ultra-exploited labor of undocumented immigrants. Um, so, you know, is he, is he going to actually maybe in, incur any resistance from big business who actually needs uh these workers and their and their labor to actually make their companies function what is what does it actually mean when he says i'm going to deport 10 million people well he he's going to have uh some contradictions as he um addresses um as he tries to implement or to fulfill his promises you know that's one of those contradictions because he has to appease his um, uh, ultra conservative base, and that's the promise that he made. But he's also a businessman who will run um, from that angle, you know, because he's but he's been an unscrupulous employer. Um, he's also a businessman who will want to have millions of people who are willing to work for five or ten dollars per hour. You know, so these are the contradictions that he is going to have to face to face you know so i don't know to what extent the business community will push back against him against fascism essentially and against his uh his supporters who are you know um xenophobes nativists anti-immigrant uh extremists so um and when he says deporting 10 million people he's not talking just about undocumented people um we live in I'm I'm an immigrant and in my family there are people who are US citizens, legal permanent residents, some folks who have DACA, some people that don't have anything, uh, or TPS. So we live in mixed status families. When he's talking about deporting 10 million undocumented people, he's talking about US citizens as well. He's talking about destroying um millions of families in 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 the country and and um you know obviously the result of that is is what you what you just stated it's like who's going to pick the lettuce and the tomatoes who's going to build the homes every time that there is a hurricane uh, who do you think comes in and and do the cleanup and the demolition and the construction the reconstruction the roofing is workers, migrant workers. There are dozens and dozens of crews right now descending in Florida in this moment when in this moment when you know reconstruction is needed. And that's where people are. And you know, people have the skills and the muscles and the mind to do these kinds of, of jobs. And people do it with with love. And you know what? Sometimes um, immigrants are not only just rebuilding homes, but rebuilding families because we you, you imagine a home, it's a family. So you rebuild a home, you rebuild a family. And and immigrants not 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 are just uh, they're not just rebuilding the homes the, in the lives of others. They're also rebuilding their own lives because they're also impacted by the same you know uh, disasters that others are impacted. So you know the fact is that immigrants have always been essential. It was only during that. The time of the pandemic that the country recognized 
the importance of low wage workers and migrant workers for a moment i felt that oh my god maybe maybe there is some sense of decency but these people are really cruel these people will take the labor and then deport uh, as many people as, as they can that's that's how low they they can they can go so so you know if um, if this threat is fulfilled the impact will be felt not just by immigrant families but american families um, i mean u.s citizens you know um and and um and like and obviously the economy and employers have uh, have their own interest uh, they also um, benefit from having an underclass of workers w workers who are willing to do whatever it takes you know because uh, that way they have the the workforce that they need you know so i don't know to what extent they would push against uh, against trump to do the right uh, thing i hope i hope they do in the past um, they have engaged but um, always in the periphery you know and um, and in my I mean the fact is that the United States need, needs workers, and they are probably going to increase the number of uh, um, um, you know guest workers who come to the fields without any rights, without any protection, without ensuring that they have all the rights that uh, the you know the rest of workers have fought so much in this country and won you know for 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 centuries you know so. Um, to you know, I don't know if that answers the question, but I, but I know that employers are caught in the between those two, between business and the right wing extremist desire to to and fear of a non white majority in our country. No, and I, I think the point you make about also capitalizing on the fear of workers to further exploit them is a really, really important point you made there. Um, and I, you know, before we get to the really important part, which is the fight back, I also wanted to ask you, you know, in this campaign, there was an intense fixation. So it was the usual anti-migrant rhetoric from Trump that we've heard before, but he also fixated on specific migrant communities, um, talking about, for example, Venezuelan migrants, you know, talking specifically about, uh, you know, this fantasy, this phantom Tren de Aragua, uh, you know, of course, talking specifically about cartels, which we know that that's a reference to Mexican immigrants in his imaginary, talking about Haitian immigrants. So what do you make of this sort of uh, fixation on certain uh, migrant groups and nationalities? Is this, and how is this actually being pushed back on uh, in, in organizing efforts? Well, <clears throat> you know, um, the oppressors always have an intention when they speak about certain groups. Um, and they know that, that uh, if they dehumanize, if they belittle, if they humiliate a group, you know, the other groups don't want to be like those who are, who are being humiliated. So these type of tactics are basically used to divide people and you you feel it in the American community some folks who have been here for for the decades and all of a sudden you know when the Venezuelans are, are coming and they're getting a temporary protected status or the Haitians are coming and you will see like well, well why is it that they're getting it and why is it that we're not and of course in 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 organizing you know we have to overcome these circumstances and the fact is that you know this type of dilemma these type of divisions are imposed from the top down, um, it's not the the you know the Venezuelans who just came came in who decided to uh, you know um, we're gonna give TPS to some or or and not to others you know so we had to make sure that first we uh, erase those kinds of resent resentment within our own uh, community. Uh, because um, that would prevent us from 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 fighting back. You know, I, I think that the fixation, uh, I mean, this is, a, I mean, Trump, it's a, it, it, it's, a, it, it, 
it's pathological almost in every dimension of of life you know um but on this one i i wouldn't define it as as a, as, as a fixation you know he knows that he was talking to to his base because what he's telling you know american workers u.s born workers is he's telling them you know what i cannot do much for you because i'm giving to the to this to, to immigrants so he's essentially putting the interest of u.s born workers against the interest of workers um of, of migrant workers you know and that way there is the tension he's also putting the interest of immigrants who have been here longer against the interest of people who who just arrived and he knows that this is playing out really well uh to split people to divide people but also in terms of like, um, you know, um, hardening the hearts and minds of of uh, his own base. Yeah, that's a super interesting point. And, you know, now Angelon and other organizations, uh, even before the elections, and I think importantly before the elections, were already and have been organizing um, and ahead of the elections was organizing popular assemblies uh, and different sort of community gatherings to resist whatever the next government is. Um, can you talk about these organizing efforts? What are these popular assemblies? Um, and also what lessons are you guys bringing to this round of organizing uh, from past decades of resisting similar policies? Well, you know, for the last decade, um, the the immigrant rights, um, to the extent there is a movement, um, has been sort of uh, led by beltway organizations, by organizations in Washington D.C., national organizations that are essentially an extension of the Democratic Party, and they would, and, and when it comes down to choosing between party and, and immigrants, they always choose the interests of, of, of the party. So the first the first point of departure when we're having these assemblies is that, um, you know, that we are on our own. That the Democrats, when they have had the power and the political clout to actually use it, to benefit immigrants, they have decided not to use it, but to use their their political capital for other priorities that they have. And I'm not saying that the other priorities are bad, like healthcare and other priorities. You know, the economy. I'm not saying that, but they this is a po political uh, decision that they've made. And and of course, you know, every time they 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 they're running they tell you well i'm gonna do immigration reform in the first 100 days you know and they end up not doing it and of course i remember and we have to remember moments in the history in, in, in history um that are i would say emblematic of, of what of what has happened i remember that the first time that trump won and he began putting little kids in cages i remember a lot of white liberals coming out and and standing with us and and you know, crying and obviously, you know, it was welcome and crying about uh, the fact that kids being put in cages. And of course, that sentiment, it's, it's who wouldn't, who wouldn't cry, who wouldn't feel sad seeing little kids in cages, you know. Um, but right immediately after um, Biden wins, that support, that movement fully dissipated, you know, and and it's not that the kids were reunified with their parents. In fact, the the majority of kids who were who were separated by Trump at that time have not been reunified with their with their with their parents. So the uh, the point of departure of every Assemblea Popular uh, that we have is we assume uh, like um, undisputable truths, and that is one undisputable truth that there is not gonna be a champion, there is not gonna be a politician, there is not gonna be a savior, there is not gonna be an organization or a supreme leader that's going to come and, and save people. And part, part of that, uh, there is a, a very famous common saying in Latin America, solo el pueblo salva 
al pueblo. Only the people save the people. Um, and, and we know that to be true in every moment of a struggle, you know. So we're telling people, you're in your own. This time, uh, we're going to build a strategy that is from the bottom up, not from the top down. Uh, it, it, in the past, you know, groups have, the, particularly the national organizations that are in extension of the Democratic Party, they have used the field, as they called local immigrant rights organizations. And they tell them, okay, here's, here are your talking points, and here is $2,000. Go and do a press conference and bring the poor immigrants to share their stories. And it's from an angle of pity. Um, and now if you go to the other side, all you see that comes out of, out of their mouths is like pure hatred. So immigrants are between the pity of some and the scorn of others. And this debate around immigration has been, has been within those, within that dichotomy, within those two, you know, poles, like those who pity immigrants and those who hate immigrants but immigrants have been absent of that conversation and uh, the idea of um, doing uh, building you know uh, self-protection committees across the country is that we're going to fill that vacuum and the people will speak for themselves part of the what's being wrong about the so-called immigrant rights movement to the extent that there is one um, is that uh, there are too many intermediaries there's too many people speaking on behalf of immigrants. And, you know, immigrants have a voice. Immigrants are very smart people. And, and definitely we can defend um, um, ourselves. So that's the point of departure. That's where we, where we engage people in the, in the process of discussion. Now, after the election, you know, today, for, today we're having our national call with our membership. And, um, of course, you know, there is fear. There's frustration, there's sadness, there's anger. All of those sentiments are all within ourselves. I mean, I have them, uh, but we cannot resist. We don't resist those sentiments. We resist the adversary, you know. And we have to embrace the fact that those sentiments exist. Now we're gonna we're gonna organize ourselves to make sure that uh, because the 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 only way that uh, Trump can fulfill the promise of deporting millions of people is if he enlists local police uh, departments and sheriff departments to enforce immigration law. You know, so we're going to pose the dilemma to local elected leaders. You know, um, are you going to protect the residents of your community, or are you going to line up with uh, with the extreme MAGA with ideology? Are you going to participate in this mass deportation operation that Trump is talking about? You know, so we're going to make sure that, that that our resistance is tangible and that um, uh, not only people come together to raise money to assist families that are in deportation proceedings or to monitor where there is um, ICE activity, but also to push local elected officials so they do the right thing, you know, and and, and the fact is that, um, you know, over half of, of immigrants live in cities, in, in states, in counties, uh, regions where there are, um, you know, layers of protection that, uh, that establish uh, a line between local law enforcement and immigration law, law enforcement. And the reason why uh, Mr. Trump couldn't deport as many people as he would have liked to deport during his first term is because these sanctuary policies exist. You know, so we're going to make sure that these uh, policies continue to exist and that we overcome the dichotomy of, of, of living within pity and scorn. Well, Pablo, thank you so much uh, for that excellent analysis. And I know that we'll be following the work of Enzalon and all the other uh, incredible organizations which are organizing now in this resistance to the uh, Trump fascism and against the anti-migrant policies.